sounds like a challenge. That sounds like a challenge to me. All right. Well, in my role as a physical therapist and professor, so we wear a lot of different hats. So instructor, coach, translational scientist. So we have to read the research and then make it happen for you at the bedside or in the clinic. But a lot of that time to make that happen, we have to wear a different role. And that is one of a cheerleader. <laughs> research, and especially on exercise with Parkinson's disease. And also, what kind of exercise should you do? There are some uh, specific Parkinson's programs that we're going to look at today. And we're going to focus on those because a lot of them are classes or motor skill, like activities that you can learn right now today. There are a bunch of pieces of equipment out there. We have some fancy treadmills at our Health and Wellness Center. There's bikes, there's other pieces of equipment, vibrating plates that are harder to get to. I want to overcome every obstacle or excuse to exercise we can. So that's what we're really going to focus on the ones you can start out and go to tomorrow. Okay? There's actually a dance for Parkinson's class tomorrow in San Francisco. So no excuses. All right. And also at the end, we'll talk about how to proceed if you're not sure who to go to. All right. Rule number one. Use it or lose it. Yeah, basically, atrophy happens to everyone with a brain. A literal brain, not a figurative brain. Um, anyway, so, rule number one, sofa is equal. Okay. Rule number two, you can use it and improve it. So people who are uh, newly diagnosed, this is a great study that just came out. They were followed for two years, all of them treated with a medication, and the experimental group got a heavy dose of physical therapy right at the beginning, and then a year later. It's like 28 days of rehab. Three hours a day, five days a week, working on balance, strengthening, 
walking, gait, agility, and then also um, some activities of daily living. Rolling, getting up from the floor, all those important things. We really worked hard. And the control group just got the only the drug. At the end, the people who got the intervention, their functional scores improved in terms of the UPDRS and the six-minute walk, and they were on less medication. So like the, the L-Dopa, they're actually using less, whereas the control group, they held ground, but with more medication. And again, these are people with brand new diagnosis, right? So pretty, pretty early on. Even for more advanced disease, if you follow them for a year with the same program, they still were using less medication in the year follow-up. So that's encouraging. There's not a whole lot of this long, long range research going on yet. So this is probably the, one of the first ones I've seen where they actually follow it over time. A lot of us don't have 28 days to go to physical therapy, like five days a week. So let's see what we can do that's a little bit more realistic. Okay. Bottom line is just do something, anything. And what they found is that if you look at like 4,866 people, just to add like a cross section, 44% of them were exercising that requisite 100, more than 150 minutes of exercise. So that's good. And then the, the rest of them were doing less. And of course, you look at this and pretty much guess that the people who were exercising more were more functional. Like just, just the people who were, who were exercising were less advanced stages of the disease. Um, had less physical disability. So you'd say, well, of course they can exercise more because they're able to. <laughs> However, this, 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 was so, this finding was so important, I thought I'm just going to quote it directly. So based on this cross-sectional an section analysis, regular exercise was, was associated with significantly better quality of life, physical function, and less caregiver burden. And here's the kicker, and this is why you tell your grandkids or kids, this is why math is, is important. The significance persisted after controlling for cognition, disease duration, severity, age, and gender. So all those reasons we had for why those people who were exercising could exercise more simply because they were different from the other people, if you put that in a big equation, control all those other variables, it still rises up. So get moving. All righty. Thankfully, some of the researchers are also doing a lot of reviews where they take they go through the literature for us, pick out the best studies, compare them, and give a systematic result. And so there's enough research on aerobic exercise currently that shows that, you know, actually like 18 decent studies, that exercise is beneficial for people with Parkinson's in the short term. Um, and that one thing that's been interesting that they're also finding is that, you know, that people benefit, but when you're actually testing someone, you know, in exercise tolerance, someone with Parkinson's, they may not respond to that peak exercise as normally as someone without Parkinson's. So there may, there may be a blunted heart rate response with that maximum exercise. So it may mean that you're gauging your response. If your heart rate doesn't seem to quite be responding, you go by how hard you feel you're working. So you're going for that moderate uh, level of activity, moderate to vigorous. And so what we know, and this is not, again, this is not a new concept, and it's also important for everyone. Not just for people with Parkinson's, but for everyone out there. The American College of Sports Medicine, which is kind of like the one of the leading bodies for, for exercise science, and also this was backed also by a lot of different professional organizations, has this whole campaign called the Exercise is Medicine. It is as important as taking a drug. And their prescription, their recommended prescription, is one you've already heard already. For healthy adults, five times a week of moderate intensity, 30 to 60 minutes a day. So that adds up to about your 150 minutes. So across the board, across organizations, we're finding, recommending that exercise, getting more movement is really important. But some of you may be thinking, oh my gosh, that's a lot of exercise. I, I can't, I'm wiped out by 10 minutes. Well, you gotta start where you are. Start where you are and be safe. Those are the two main criteria. But you can't start anywhere else. The big thing is also even just small increments of exercise, just 10 minutes more of activity, just sneaking in a couple times a day, is an additive effect of 30 minutes a day. That can still help. And also, we're here to help you get going if you need it. So the other concern is, okay, we're talking about walking. You know, walking is great, but what if you're having trouble walking? Well, we got to get past that barrier as well. Again, we're trying to eliminate obstacles to mobility. <clears throat> so with that, Oftentimes, we might find it important to use uh, an assistive device. 
such as a walk or a cane or, or the rollators. And finally, I've been waiting for this study for a long time, somebody finally actually looked at the gait quality in people with Huntington's and Parkinson's with different assistive devices. And this one is actually kind of fun. So basically they use this thing called a uh, gait right map. It's basically as if you would put teal paint on one foot and magenta paint on the other, and then they just walk across the mat. And that's, that's the track of their footprints. And so you, as you notice, this is someone with Huntington's, but you notice with that, without anything, their gait pattern is a little irregular. Look what happens when they use the cane or, or the, uh, the standard walker. It goes from being a little regular to, right? That can make it worse. Similar with, with the front wheel one. But what they're finding is that with the rollator, gait's less variable and more consistent. And that's true for people with Parkinson's as well. So the bottom line is that the rollator you know, can be better, and the four-wheeled walker was the most effective at increasing gait stability and consistency. With, um, with some of the studies, they were finding that the U-step had a little bit more variability, and the U-step is the one that has a reverse braking system, which means you have to squeeze the brakes in order to go, which allows people who are worried about the rollator kind of getting away from you. What that does is that you have to really want to go, so you have to squeeze the brakes to allow it to move. It's also a lot heavier, and designed in particular for people with movement disorders. So the, the, a lot of clinicians like it, because it just makes sense, a lot of patients like it, it hasn't so far withstood the rigors of scientific inquiry, as we say, but um, some people do find benefit from it. But canes and the, and the four-foot walkers tend to cause a little bit more problems. Um, I know a lot of you tend to like using canes because it does provide that little point of support, and early on that can be okay. The problem is that oftentimes it ends up getting in people's way. So they end up carrying it or putting it off to the side, and it becomes a dual task challenge as opposed to an assisted device. Okay. So here's the question: Is when when does one start? When should one start using a walker? Um, if you're falling frequently, the big thing again is the theme of overcoming obstacles. If you're not moving because you're afraid of falling or you're having trouble walking, that's the time to start considering using something. Because again. You, the law of use it or lose it. If you stop walking, it makes it harder to walk. So you need to keep moving by any means necessary. Okay. So also that means it takes, you know, if, if, if you're working harder to walk. There's actually one study that just came out where they're actually trying to identify who tends to use a walker and who doesn't. And there's two simple tests that actually can help sort of clinicians figure out are they ready for a walker or not. One of them is the five meter timed up and go. Which, if you've been to PT or others, you may have seen the three meter one. That's just this one. Yeah. Specific balance scale. If you're less than 70 or 75 percent confident, if you're at poor, if you have low balance confidence, that's a reason to also use the walker. It's, neat, it's, it's important to get moving, and if you're afraid, again, if you're afraid of falling, you're not going to walk. It's important to keep walking, however you need to. Okay. So bottom line, I'm just saying again, I'm repeating myself because it's important. Using the walker allows you to get move more, use it. Okay. And also, if you have questions about it, which one to use, that's what we're here for. We can take them for a test drive. Okay. So, on to Parkinson-specific programs. So the big ones that have been studied a lot are dance, speed, especially boxing training. There's also the LSVT loud and big, and it's sort of evolution into Parkinson's wellness recovery, or PWR or I'll do that later. But then also you've heard, heard a little bit about Tai Chi already, um, and we'll go into that a little bit more. So, dance. Who remembers what movie this is from? Okay. 
So this is this is the uh, the, the show scene from uh, Singing in the Rain. We're talking about this. This it, he has this idea for a show, and it's this hooker. Where what is he singing? What do you think he's singing? Yeah, exactly. Gotta dance, right? So that's what you gotta do. Just keep moving. So the dancing they actually study with a lot of these review papers was uh, Argentine tango. But yeah, two can tango well shotters. This is not a new idea. So um, as you learned, I went to physical therapy school here uh, from '95 or '93 um, to '95, and my mentor was Marsha Melnick. So she's done a lot of research on on basal ganglia and Parkinson's. And back then, even we learned that the she she was teaching her patients with Parkinson's mambo. Why mambo? You know what mambo looks like? Do you think Parkinson's wants you to do that? No. Do you think by doing that, you're actually fighting back Parkinson's? Absolutely. You think it's hard? What if it's hard as slippery? It's slippery. You want to be challenged with your activity. So, Mambo, Shottish. I've also tried Shottish in class. That's a pretty tricky one. Remember that? One, two, three, hop. One, two, three, hop. Again, I just want to spin. But any kind of dancing could be helpful. But there's just more research to prove that tango helps. Okay. Boxing. Does boxing and Parkinson's kind of make sense? Again, because Parkinson's wants you to move slowly. Do people punch slowly? Not if they want to be successful. <laughs> no. Boxing is fast. Requires a lot of rotation, explosive movement, um, reaction time, attention. If you've got a heavy bag in front of you or somebody holding boxing mitts, you can't think about anything else but what's right in front of you. And it's also a lot of fun. You would be surprised by how hard, how much harder people hit when they have something in front of them that's a target. In front of them that's a target. I've seen it a million times over. I will put boxing gloves on the most mildest mannered, quiet, demure person who will do this when you ask her to. But you put the boxing mitts and focus pads. <laughs> it's impressive. Um, just Friday in my balance fit class, we I have a background in Taekwondo, so I'm sort of biased towards kicking things. We had an activity where we were holding onto the rail and doing this. Even just doing that, everyone looked pretty good. They were moving pretty quickly. But I busted out the Taekwondo focus pads. Nearly took my arm off. So the person who was going quickly, here, suddenly was going, ah, ah. Yeah. My arm kind of hurts because you took it off. So, again, something that Parkinson's doesn't want you to do, but you're doing anyway. And again, you got a rail, you got something to hold on to, so you're safe. So that's the balance with all of these activities, is challenging yourself optimally, but also safely. So that's the key thing, especially with balance and things like that. Your balance is great lying down, but doing exercise lying down is not necessarily gonna help your balance. Right, so you gotta do things standing, but standing in a way that you can control and be safe. Okay. So big, or LSVT big and loud, as well as power, and what happened with these is that Becky Farley was the one that sort of helped uh, develop BIG. And then she was realizing that BIG wasn't just a series of exercises to do, or these calisthenics, but it was the whole program of getting that cardiovascular exercise, it's getting the engagement. And that's why she turned it into P-W-R, <laughs> Parkinson's Wellness Recovery. Again, the skirt makes you do crazy things. <laughs> but what this is about is Again, counteracting what Parkinson's doesn't want you to do. Moving with large amplitude is difficult. And often, you may think you're moving in the, it big enough, and you're, you're not. So it's a way of, uh, of retraining your brain what big enough is. Right? So for example, a simple act of standing up becomes an exercise. So, Right? Well, you know, chest up, shoulders back, hands open. Does Parkinson's want you to stand like this? Do you 
think you stand better if you work on that walk? Again, big thing for standing up. If you're having trouble standing or on your own at home, you can still do the same idea in your chair. Reaching up, reach, grow, getting those weights. All those things are really important and can help you move. If you're on your own, worried about falling or don't what you know, don't feel comfortable doing it standing, you can do it sitting. Probably with the chair without armrest might be a little bit better. <laughs> I'm just saying, you can work on stepping. Right? Yeah, doing exercise standing is gonna be better for your balance, but if it's a, it's a choice of not exercising at all, or exercising in a chair, exercise in your chair. On the other end of the spectrum, we worked on speed, we worked on amplitude, but we've also worked, learned about Tai Chi. And Tai Chi, as you know, is a rather slow form of martial art. It's very mindful, and actually, it has enough research now to perform a systematic review where they actually found seven randomized controlled trials looking at the benefit of, of Tai Chi. And it is what you expect. When you compare it to nothing, people did better on quality of life and, um, and balance, but, um, but not necessarily with gait. Because if you think about it, it's very specific. With, with Tai Chi, you're working on body awareness and alignment. And stepping and weight shifting. Those kind of things work on your balance and body awareness, which is great. I'm not a Tai master, but it's much better for balance because it's specific to balance. You're not practicing walking and working on Tai Chi, so it's not necessarily going to have the broader effect on that. Okay. So bottom line, people with Parkinson's can benefit from exercise, as can everyone benefit from exercise. You know, if you have a brain, if you have a heart, you can benefit from exercise. And benefits are specific to the type of training. So if you want to work on your endurance, you have to make yourself tired. Get that cardiovascular exercise, your 30 minutes a day. If you want to work on your balance, you need to work on balance. And not necessarily the, uh, you know, standing on one foot. That's all well and good, but balancing when you're moving. So changing direction, turning, stepping over objects, things like that. Ways to overcome, overcome obstacles, a lot of people go, oh, I don't have time. It's too hard. If you take your medications, treat this like a medication. Or, or even, I've, I've thought about making exercise pills that we can put in pill boxes. <laughs> right? You know, you open up a little box and go, okay, I've got, you know, this medication. Oh, I've got bicycle today. You know, or I've got calisthenics. Oh, stop. Set your timer. You have 20 minutes, you're done. Again, small portion of your day with a big payoff. Side effects are usually very minimal. Yeah, we didn't say that about very few medications. The side effects of exercise are usually all positive if you have the right prescription for you. Okay, if you're having trouble being motivated, taking a class. If there's somewhere you have to be at a certain time every day, that tends to work for people. Um, and also, if you have somebody you're held accountable to. If you have a friend, a family member, something where you've signed a pack to agree to go exercise, that can be really helpful. My friend just got me into swimming in the bay, and so she'll call and say, hey, you going swimming? I'm like, it's cold, but okay. Let's go. Having a buddy will help you do this. I've actually prescribed a dog twice. I was really worried about doing that. But if you love dogs, if you have a dog family, if you have a family member that can support you, your dog is your built-in exercise compliance tool. You know, that dog needs to be walked. So there you go, you got your 30 minutes just by taking Fido out. Okay, so in sum, exercise is medication, right? The mode is up to you. It's the, the best exercise is the one you'll actually do consistently. But the key thing too is that it's not just about the movement, what I liked about this exercise we did here is that, you know, in, uh, at the beginning of our talk here, was it not only got you moving, but you had to pay attention. You had to keep track. You had to engage. And so that's what's great about all these programs, too, is that it's not just the cardiovascular benefit of the boxing, of the, of the Tai Chi or the dancing. 
It's the fact that your mind is engaged in learning something new. That is important for everyone as well, especially if you have Parkinson's. So if you, don't, if you have an exercise and you're new to exercise, it's always important. It's always good to consult with your physician before starting an exercise program. That's the like the sort of garden variety rule, especially if you have any other medical history such as heart um, heart disease or diabetes. Consult with your physician. With, when going to physical therapy, a lot of us have been around for a long time or working a long time, and we have our specialties. So a lot of physical therapists may focus in orthopedics. You want somebody who focuses in neurology and, and gets Parkinson's. So if you see the, the letters NCS, that means they've passed a very expensive test that shows that they do a lot of neuro. So an NCS is a good, a good metric to look for. They may be a neuro expert and just have it taken the exam. So it's not entirely inclusive. So most clinics based in the hospital will more likely have someone who specializes in neurology than your you know, cl clinic based in a script mall or something like that. Other people can, that can be really helpful are personal trainers. The drawback is that physical therapists have to pass a license in order to practice. There's no industry standard for personal trainers. So some may be um, just trained by their, by their institution or just work out a lot. Others may have degrees in exercise physiology and advanced certifications. So you really have to ask your trainer what their background is. So good things to look for are certifications through the American College of Sports Medicine. The National Association of um, the National Athletic Training Association, or uh, American Council on Exercise, or ACE. Um, also, Becky Farley and her power team have a certification specifically for exercise instructors. So you may have a power certified uh, personal trainer. So that's what you want to look for: somebody who actually is familiar with Parkinson's and has done has has done the the academic work to, to prove it. Okay. So for us. If you're affiliated with UCSF and want to come to our programs, it's either myself or my, uh, we actually have three neuro PTs now and we're all clinical specialists. So there's myself, Allison, which comes back to maternity leave, uh, Heather, and Jennifer. So we're all at the faculty practice. Um, or if your insurance is not paying for physical therapy anymore, that's quite a big problem for a lot of people. So we also have our health and wellness center, which is across, this, actually it's in this building like the first floor in the gym, where it's a cash pay uh, program. We also have two group classes there, a balance class based on the power moves and dancing and dual tasking and anything else I can throw at you. Um, and Nancy Beale has a high intensity uh, uh, training class as well. So with that, we got done quickly. Five minutes, I guess, sorry. And we're good. I was fast and I talked too fast. So. Yeah,